today's talk is a bit about so uh, a bit about my journey on getting to know AI automation and how it actually affects AI systems. And then um, let's go through a bit the, the journey of it. So let's just to start with a, a bit about myself. So Peter Centoducato, I'm Brazilian, but a proud holder of Italian name. Uh, family name, but you see, I don't have the Italian charming accent uh, that we saw uh, just before with, with Francesco. Actually, so I did my studies in Brazil. I moved to France when I had my first job, and that's where I got the French accent that you can hear a little bit now. A bit of a strong language, colonial language. So at, at, uh, when I was in, in Paris, I was working as a dev, so a software engineering, and I was helping a company to move from uh, on-premise to cloud. So basically, we had a, a software that we're trying to transform into a SaaS platform. And that was the first time that I actually had um, some connection with distributed systems, architectures, and trying to build a software that's not on client side, but actually now on the cloud and then serving the clients. And that was the first time that I was a bit more exposed with statistics, because when you're working with distributed systems and you really want to know how load works and how uh, machines will be managing the different jobs, et cetera, that's where I got my first exposure. And then I moved uh, from the software company to a data science consulting company that's called Artifact. It's a, it's a French one. Uh, I spent a couple of years with them in Paris. Then I had an opportunity to come to Shanghai. So I did a bit more data science with them there where I was building the team. And I had the opportunity to join uh, Data Robot coming to, to Hong Kong. So I, I was lucky to have just like one week of quarantine because I was in from England. And after that, I joined uh, Data Robot here with Alex and, and the team. That's probably connected on, on the online chat. And, um, and from there, the, the biggest difference, actually the biggest gap, was coming from a background that you are working as a consultant and you are getting hired by companies, paying by projects. So you are helping them actually building from scratch AI systems and trying to evangelize all the C-level executives so they can actually build momentum within the company and then they can do their digital transformation. And I was discussing with Alex at the beginning of the year because we have some common friends and he, he was hearing this story about the time that I was spent actually building those systems from scratch and he found the perfect opportunity to actually pitch a data laboratory. And that's where I got interested to that because I had a lot of internal initiatives that I was spending on my own time trying to create those modules, those automated modules, but... Uh, at some point, it's just too much work for one person. So in today's talk, uh, we're going to go through basically those two things. A bit about my past and uh, an actual use case that I've built uh, from scratch when I was in my, in my past company. Uh, for, for this one today, I just got uh, one of the examples of the latest one that I did. So sales forecasting that was a bit more fresh in my head. And the challenge that we had, actually building that with the clients. And then how it actually changes when we apply automation to this kind of system. And what are the, the challenges that get solved by automation? And what are the things that still don't get solved uh, by automation as we are today? And uh, at the end, so I'll try to, to go a bit fast as well to get to at, at a point at the end to show you actually the platform. So I'm not just going through slides and we actually see the product working and then how things go. So the two main takeaways for AI automation, and uh, that's what we're going to see on every step, is really two pillars. Uh, productivity and democratization. So productivity, because you as a data scientist and a data analysis, when you do data science, you spend a lot of time doing repetitive work, as Alex was saying, when you say like Kaggle competitions or actual projects in real life, you spend a lot of time just repeating and repeating to test and iterate. Because at, at the end of the day, data science is really iteration. It's getting something fast, done, that doesn't work that well, but at least is there. And then you just iterate to get it better and better until it gets actually useful and you get paid to have an unuseful thing at the end of the day. And democratization is mostly because from some statistics, we have a lot of demand in the market for data science coders, people with specialized um, careers on uh, data science. And now what we're trying to do in automation is not only make it more productive for people who do who does data science, but actually for everyone that knows about data, so that they're experts, that do not have a past experience in coding as software engineers. So they can use this tool as well to get things done and trend. So it's really to broaden the scope of who's actually participating in the data science projects. And uh, here, just for one of the things, uh, basically 100% of my clients, when I was working in consulting before, on the democratization aspect, you always had two to three people in the company that were data scientists that could actually work 
on the projects and trends with coding in about 2025 that would classify themselves as data analysts, business analysts that were super interested about what we are doing. But the only thing that they could do is actually use uh, dashboards, a lot of Excel, but they didn't really feel comfortable using the tools that we were using day in, day out. So we would sell a lot of trainings to them. So we would spend four months, six months training those people to make them become data scientists on coding base. And now what we're doing is trying to do the opposite, right? Bringing the product to people and abstracting away the, the, the coding behind everything. Okay. So for the sales forecasting use case, uh, I'll spend some minutes just going through why is it interesting and why are we doing that? So for AI systems, you usually start by framing the business challenge. Then you go to actually build your first AI model. And at the point that you get something that works, you spend time oper operationalizing the model. And so this kind of presentation is actually quite hard to do on online and offline. So if you want to help me, just jump in, show your hands, ask questions, and then we can transform it into a bit more uh, discussion. So why should we care about the uh, demand sensing? So basically, sales forecasts is trying to know the demand side of things. That's the easiest thing to, to predict. So how many people are buying every week, every day, et cetera. And from that, you can derive all the rest of the supply chain parts. So you can know how many things you have to produce to get these products in the store. How do you manage your fleet of trucks, your fleet of uh, the whole supply chain to see how many products you have to have in each node of your supply chain at each point. And this, when you're on the consulting hat, is one of the first use cases that people talk about because it's super easy to connect it directly to money. Every point in accuracy that you get in sales forecasting, demand sensing, you can connect directly to money on missed sales opportunities, customer satisfaction, write-offs, inventory costs. So everything is really easy to just put down. And when you work with uh, supply chain and operations in companies, they are super focused on reducing costs because basically for these clients, 20% of their products were write-offs. So it's stuff that got to the supermarkets and just um, went to the, to the trash afterwards because it's just not sold. Um, and then of course, all the price to actually get this product to the supermarket. Okay. Yes, and not only because it's a nice use case, but mostly because their models were all broken. So everyone that had something was not working anymore. So they would call us in to actually help ramp up the team and try to find some solutions. And, uh, and then everyone that was not doing that, they started to do a lot of online e-commerce. So e-commerce. And then they would ask us to help them out on distribution channels. Because one day you have all your motor stores. The next day you have to have half of them on online platforms. So you have to diversify your supply chain in a, yeah, overnight yeah, in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Yes. So the question was if the demand for forecasting, demand sensing forecasting had increased, had changed with the COVID. Okay. And if there's anything that pops up on the chat, if you can, uh, yeah, cool. Thanks. All right. So here just for Oh, for the overview. Um, so for this use case particularly, when you think about the framing of it, okay, <laughs> we'll try to use this. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's really bad to read right, because of the, our high quality projector. But uh, so what we wanted to do here is predict weekly sales on um, eight weeks horizon, because that was what they needed for uh, pushing things out of production. So they could not make decisions less than eight weeks out for generating the products. And then it was related to their market needs as well. So store item level for, uh, for the whole uh, China tier one cities on, uh, on this distributor. And uh, we'll talk a bit more about performance later on, but uh, basically they already had a model in place. What we wanted to help them to do is to have less people working on this model because they basically had a five people team working half time. So 50% FT on those five people to generate reports monthly, to decide things on the supply chain side. And our ambition was to get it weekly uh, with an automated system, maybe one FT, one person full time that would work on it um, to, to get things going. Because it's, it's like awkward when you think about it, that there's a company that has five people that are there just to work on the same scripts, the same files, running the same things on Excel every month. Okay, so when we actually go to the building phase, and that might resonate with uh, some of the people that worked on the data science project. 
And of course, from time to time, there's different frameworks. But basically, we go through this iterative process. And one of the objectives is really to get to one, one side to the other as fast as possible. So you have something at the end of the day to iterate on and to start actually sharing with the executives, sharing with the people that are paying for the project. So you can show some progress with something that's not just statistics and metrics. So you really get to the place that you're saying, OK, with this actual model, we are improving the accuracy by 0.2%. That represents that many write-offs, that represent that much money, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how you build momentum with them to keep working on that. And then to decide when you stop, because data science, you can go indefinitely, right? You can always improve a little bit. It's just that at some point, the cost of improving a little bit is just too high and it's not worth the time that you spend. So that's where we need the executive help to create this kind of a cost curve on, uh, on the project itself. So a lot of iterations. And uh, here, one of the things that we will connect afterwards with automation is that this process is almost rebuilding from scratch every time because different architectures of models, different features that you're using, you have to kind of build from scratch your validation and uh, everything that you're actually coding in and coding out. You basically reuse 20 to 30% of what you've written. The rest is every iteration you're writing again. Okay, so after three months of work, and just to give you a bit of more uh, concrete results, that's where we got. So three months afterwards, we had tested only five models with about four people in the team. And we finally get to our AGB, which really uh, finished, but I won't bother you too much with those details. But that is just that we had spent three months working on this project to get to a final iteration that was useful for the business. It was the moment that they said, okay, the money that I'm paying for having you guys working here, it's worth actually putting it on the on production and uh, getting it downstream to actually get the results and use it afterwards. And one thing that's interesting and maybe can be news for some, some of you will be that when you do sales forecast, it's not just about the forecast, but it's also about the confidence interval. So it's giving executives and the supply chain team, not just the number of products per, per star per week, but also your confidence interval in a certain percentage. So you are 80% sure that the number will not be higher than this or lower than that. And with that, they can make a bit better decisions than just having a, a number. So that's something that complexifies a bit the system downstream as well, because you have to have separate models to do different things. And then, okay, that's not easy to read. So basically what we have here is the validation process. Um, how, how many of you are, are um, used to work with time series, time series models? Okay. so. I think I can safely assume that when you work with time series, going from a normal machine learning product to time series, you're basically increasing your complexity by three or four on just how you use the data, how you create your features, how you derive everything. So here there's a lot of work on just finding the right split of your data to know how many months to use to train, how many months to use to validate, et cetera. And every time that you change it, you can actually change a lot of things on your script as well to work on that. And each model will have a different set of things that work better. So you really have to decide where you put, but it's important to, to spend time on that. Then the performance itself, that's what at the end of the day was good enough for this project. So you had six points of accuracy, minus nine points of bias, which would give them basically a investment ROI that would be a bit over the 300, 400%. And usually that's the number that will fly with uh, with executives. So when we get that, that was after three months of test and trial and getting this final, final model. And here, just for uh, some ideas of the top features. So basically what we have at the end of the day is when you are a data scientist and you're working on this model, you worked hard on it, you spent time on it. At the end of the day, you had some tests that you did yourself. But from time to time, you present the model to executives. They would like the explanation, what's driving the model. I don't, I don't want to use like a black box, et cetera. So you always have the risk that the model that you arrived at the end of the day when you present it to the executive, say, okay, that, that makes no sense to use those features as important features for this model. So they would challenge quite a bit. In this case, we got something that uh, didn't have this kind of pushback, but in other projects, you, you can have this kind of thing. Because from time to time, it's just non-intuitive and you can use it as a learning, but also can be a blocker with some people that will be a bit more, um, will not trust machine learning, I would say. So one of the important things here is really to spend time on Explaining your model, making sure that whatever you're creating as results, you can explain it and you can actually push it to, to other people outside your team 
so they know a bit more what's happening behind the scenes. So here was quite aligned with what they expected. So item sales, category of sales were really important. Day of the week was really important. Calendar events, promotions, store locations, and size. So everything's quite aligned, so no, not much challenges on this one. And that's where, after three months, you get to the point that, okay, this model is going to production. Let's go for that. Then you have to actually think about the rest of the AI system. And that's where things get super tricky because usually this is something that's quite hard to estimate how long you're going to spend to do that. Because everything is nice on paper. When you start working on the AI system that goes around, you're not just talking to business. You're not just talking to the analytics team that are interested in the solution. You start talking with IT, MLOps, DevOps teams on the company. They have a different agenda. They have a different thing that they are. And, and usually, uh, their focus is not so much on going fast. Their focus is on making sure that whatever they have today works and they have the resources on uh, the, the ongoing process of the company. So it's quite hard to, to get in. And without surprise, an AI system goes a long way. So you start with data, data sources. You actually have data ingestion, data preparation. You get basically two blocks on data modeling and everything that you do for exploration. You actually push those results back to somewhere that you can use, and then you consume them with uh, your final application. So here, a couple of examples would be uh, your dashboard, your reporting, uh, your API that you're pushing back into a certain system. And quite a bit of people will have the focus here. Then you have another part that's a different beast, that's the CI, CD, and actually governance process. So you have a lot of things to put in place to have your model in production in a way that six months from now is not going to be a, just a headache for everyone. And you have, to have teams in place to, to keep it running and to make use of it. And the main message here is really that once you go through the complicated process and cool process, actually, for a data scientist to actually build your model and test your, your assumptions and get something that works, you still have a long road ahead of actually getting this model in production and get people actually using it. And six months from now, it's still there. It's not just dead. And, and put aside. Yeah. So the, the question was, is it uh, the data science team that built the pipeline? So it was our team, but data engineers on our team and ML ops on our team. So I was working on both sides because I have a bit of data engineering background from before. So I would work on the architecture itself and, and building it up. Uh, but usually the data scientists will be less interested in actually implementing the whole system. And our, our conversation or a struggle will go from business to actually IT. So I would spend a lot of time with IT folks to have an architecture that's actually aligned to them. Because that brings us to the next part, that is for those who actually worked on an architecture for AI systems, you know that you have about 100 options for each thing that you're going to do. You have open source options. You have enterprise options. You have all those logos that you can put away. Um, what's best for your use case? is probably not exactly what's best for either the company or other use cases or the legacy system in the company. So even if you have an idea of what's the best practice and what's the best in the industry, when you bring it to IT, when you bring it to the people that matter to make the decision, that's when the conversation starts. And it usually takes quite a bit of time to align on all those tools. So here you really have companies that already implemented some part of the CICD process because they already have some software process, software development process, so you have to align with that. Then you have legacy systems on data sources and data ingestion that they're already using for other things, so you have to align with that as well. And with every tool that you choose, there are constraints that get bring, brought on your use case. So for instance here, one of the issues that we had is that the data source that they had did not cover all the types of data that we we're using in the use case. So at this point, you have to push for another solution, but then are they actually paying for a new solution just for your use case? So there's a lot of back and forth on what's useful to have, what's the next generation so we can pay it, but amortize it with other use cases as well. A lot of just investment uh, discussions on how to get it. And the worst thing is not that, is that when you get to this point, you are including IT folks into the discussion, right? So nobody wants to talk to you until your use case is ready to deployment. That means that after three months of work, you may have a couple of months of just standby to define what you're going to do to actually implement it, if it's the first use case of the company. So it's a, it's a bit of a struggle to bring the discussion early on the deployment of the use case when you start working with them, but it's totally worth it. 
but the, 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 the highlight here is really that you have a lot of different tools. You have to make some decisions. And once those decisions are made, you are usually not the one that's, that has the ownership of implementing them. So things can get back to a normal rhythm and you can maybe see the solution in eight months or something like this. In this case, we pushed to have ownership of it with the teams. So we were coaching the IT teams to actually build it. And we, we got down to, to something that looks a bit like this. Uh, so the final system for us was a full CI CD process that's basically uh, built on top of um, Azure and, and Amazon. That was the tools that they were using back then. Um, if I just go through that, you have an, give a, a quick idea. You have a system that has to have enough features for people to deploy new solutions, to update their models, to work on the code, to have everything automated down the stream to every time that somebody pushes something that's different on the use case, it gets tested and get deployed and it actually gets to the final user at the end of the day. So all this, usually for an organization, I've never been to a client that they had the system in place when we started working with them. Because we're not working with uh, the big tech companies, right? We are working with people that want to do their digital transformation and get there. So we are the ones lighting the way and showing which are the best practices, which are the best tools for each kind of job. And you have to build it from scratch. And what usually happens is that when you're building this, they already have three projects of architecture going on in place. Uh, usually <laughs> it's a big data lake project that's been going on for three years and they've put like 5 million bucks in it. And it's not really going anywhere because data is important, but if you don't have a use case, what are you doing with that? And then it's a, it's a bit complicated to, to go around. But we got here at the end of the day. And the highlight is really to understand that there's a lot of moving parts. So as soon as you have a solution like this, it's really cool as a data science and data engineer to be able to actually choose all these and, and set it up. But the reality is really different, right? You, you spend a lot of time just putting things down. So stepping back on the whole process and highlighting a bit some of the challenges, we have two weeks of framing the use case, making sure that we had access to the right data, making sure that we were solving the right problem. Three months of MVP to get to our final model. Four months of industrialization. So the system that you saw, you had like four months, five people working on it that knew what they were doing. They were not learning how to do it. They were just like implementing it. And it took four months to actually get everything in shape and, uh, and put in production. And now we have a continuous system working on. You have some people that are assigned to the system that every two weeks they will meet. They'll make sure that everything is okay. But it's mostly... Um, reactive status of when you have a problem, you go there, you manage your alerts, et cetera. But you do have to have the team of people that are quite specialized doing that. So the two main messages here, if you go back to productivity and democratization, the challenges will be the productivity. You have a lot of specialized talents, people with quite a bit of experience on each one of their own domains, working together to get this thing across. And even if they know what they're doing, if they did it before, as it is a new project, it took three months to get end to end. And on the democratization, you really have all those different talents working on that. So you have basically 20 years accumulated experience on data science, data engineering, another 30 years to get things off the ground and making sure that you have a system that works at the end of the day. Let me just quick check on time. All right. And uh, when I was talking with, uh, with Alex a couple of months ago, beginning of the year, I was explaining a bit that without the slides, of course. And he said, okay, maybe there's something that you're doing that can be covered by what I'm doing. And then we started discussing a bit uh, data robot that's a AI enterprise platform. And here I tried to make it a bit more like the automation part, not the company itself. But basically what we can do with automated tools is to cover a big part of it up to the data sources. So you are bringing data sources into the platform connecting it back with the connectors and the rest of it is covered by, by the platform itself. Um, I'll, I'll quickly go through that in a, in a demo and show really how, how it works. But the thing is really that when you separate those two parts, data science, building the models, validating everything, getting things done and actually pushing the results back to the business so they have the buy-in, they pay you to, to actually do it, to the moment that you actually do the industrialization, all these are really two separate parts with two different profiles working on that and two different clearance kind of gates to go through the organization. And here the idea is really to boost and to um, accelerate this transformation by implementing the tool that will actually give a common platform for the whole thing so people can connect and, and work together. 
And then the most skeptical would be a bit like, oh yeah, okay, like uh, fairy dust, cool, why not? So what? Sorry, I probably muted myself again. Can you still hear me, internet? Okay, thank you, sir. Um, yeah. So what I'll do again, so I, we can uh, wake up a little bit as well. I'll, I'll go through a quick demo, but the idea is really to be interactive. So uh, I'll start going through the interface just to show you a bit what it actually looks like. Um, and any questions, anything that you've seen before that would be interesting to jump in, uh, please go ahead. Here what I did is just to load um, a data set for sales forecast. So it's not the same data set that I was using on, uh, on the other project, of course, but it's uh, a data set from one of the competitions that we're using to do that. And here on the platform, what you have is a big and nice start button with uh, all the settings that you can do around it. So here, just to show you a bit how, what it looks like, this data set is a uh, multi-series time series. So what you have is several stores with the sales per day. And uh, what we want to predict is sales per day per store on, uh, on day level by, by store level. Yeah. So basically you have a little bit of information about its stores and information that you can or cannot use on each one of the days itself. And here, so I'll just go ahead and select our sales. I'll set it up as a time series model. Let me yeah, close this one. Here, I'll just choose automated series forecast. It identifies potential two things. So star, star size, we use star as our series identifier. So here, what we're telling data robot is that you have several series inside your data set. Each series you have to treat separately. And here's something that's quite interesting because we wanted to do that on our, our use case, on the sales uh, demand for so we're doing SKU per store, right? And the thing is that once you start treating series separately and you want to use patterns from one series to implement in the other one, you just increase by 100% your, your workload to actually work on the problem. And, and the issue is that you don't know if it's gonna work and be helpful once until you fin finish the first model and you see a bit the difference between using the patterns on the series or not. And uh, that's what was one of the first walls that I had with the job. It's really seeing that, okay, you click on it and then all the automation goes behind and actually prepares all those series for you to, to connect it back. So here in this case, and, and by the way, there's a lot of things that we won't see here because I won't take like two hours to do the, the demo. So if anything that you see on the screen that I'm not talking about and you want to know a bit more about, we can, uh, we can spend a couple of seconds on, on explaining what it is. So here on time series forecasting, you have basically the flexibility on a visual interface without coding to choose how many days before you're gonna to use to create your variables and to consider for sales. You can define your forecast window. So here we're gonna define seven days in the future, one day per um, forecast. And then you can set up uh, other things in the project. You can decide how to derive your features, how to create your feature engineering, add calendars and, and whatnot. But here we will, We'll go here and at this point you can actually click start. And when you click start, what we have here on the right side. So, yeah. On yes. Okay, so the question is about uh, data preparation and if the platform assumes that we prepared this data because yeah, I do agree a, a lot of uh, a lot of time that you use is actually preparing the data. So here we are focusing on the machine learning uh, platform, but we do have a data preparation platform as well. And there's a, a bit of a trick here because the platform is already doing a lot of the data prep work by itself automatically. And we will see a bit some of the features on, on the next page, but um, it, it does expect a certain shape of data set to be added to it to do time series. And this you can do on the other platform. And you can also do with features in this platform as well as reshaping the data, change the granularity. Let's say that you have daily data, you wanna transform it in weekly data, the platform can do that for you as well automatically, all that without code. So that's pretty cool. But we do have another platform with the full data prep capabilities that's running like Spark SQL behind the scenes. So you can prepare the, the data without much problems on scalability. Does that answer the, the question? Okay, let's see if there's any follow-ups. Uh, but here on the right side, what we can see is that it's actually doing a couple of things. And when we look back on what we presented before, so we had three months of data science for a simple time series that we're working on. And here, so data robot is 
taking the, the information on the data set, deriving time series. So basically creating different legs, different windows, different derivations between the different time series and we'll see the results afterwards. It creates the back testing and holdout partitions. So that's the part that we were talking about when we saw the splitting of the data set. So everything that's time-based that you have to split and create your validation set, et cetera, it's uh, working on that as well. And of course, you, you can set it up if you want to have something that connects back to something that you did before. If you want to compare it to a baseline that you have before, you can also upload your baseline to the data robot so you have the, the gap between them. Um, there's a lot of different steps on really automation. So every time that you do time series, those are the steps that go through. But of course, the operations itself, it changes um, by the data set that you implement. So there's some tests, some analytical tests that we do in each one of the data sets that are uploaded. And then the operations will change based on that. So this would take about... Uh, 20, 25 minutes. So I prepared that before so we can see the results. So if I just go to my next project that this is already run. Let me just, yes. Ah, uh, so this one, I'm, wait, let me just check. Uh -uh. What's the sinking size? This one's about um, 100K lines, but... Uh, okay. Ah, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah the, the double, double edge. So uh, the question is just uh, how many lines of data you have for it to take about 20 to 30 minutes. So here's about 100K. But uh, the thing is that if you think about the 30 minutes and what's doing behind the scenes, then uh, it, it's funny because actually I did the same comment to, to Alex today. I was saying, okay, uh, we cannot do everything live because it will take like about 20 minutes and we won't wait for it. And then it's funny to say that we we'll wait 20 minutes and that's too much for a presentation because when you see what's actually doing behind the scenes and the number of models and number of tests that it's doing, it's almost like, <laughs> I shouldn't say that's taking too long, you know, but uh, yeah. But yeah, about, about 100K. Yeah. And then if it's like, yeah, yeah. About 10 stores and 10K, 10K uh, did it for, for each one of these stores. Yeah. You mean, where, where is it running? Yeah. Okay, so the question is, this data is, where is it uploaded to and uh, where is it running? So in this case, here is a cloud instance of the platform. So I'm connecting it back to a data set and running it, but the software can be installed on premises as well if there's any like privacy issues, etc. and it, it can be run, but it runs over a uh, virtual machine. So you have a uh, Adobe cluster and the workers that work on that, yeah. Okay. First, the data source, is it the database or is it S3 or? Yeah, so wh where's the data source, the question? So this one here is a CSV file that I uploaded, but then you have connectors to Snowflake, S3, all the buckets on the different cloud providers, the SQL servers like a GDPL uh, connector. So you can basically connect to the different uh, data sources. And we also have our own kind of AI catalog that does governance. And then you can connect this platform to the data prep platform. So you have one place to, to manage all the versions, to manage all the collaboration between people. So if you go in and change the data set and I go and I try to run the pipeline, I see that you connected this time and you did this change to the, to the data set. And then I can choose which version of the data set to use on the new pipeline to refresh the data or to refresh the predictions. Okay. Um, so here, the first thing that we see once we run everything is the original time series data. So here we have the list of features that we had at the beginning. Uh, so we had about 21 features. And if we go and we click on derived modeling data, we see all the features the data robot generated automatically from the data set. So that's where, when you're doing the project, that, that's where most of those three maps are. When you're creating new variables, testing new models, et cetera, you're spending so much time brainstorming and thinking, okay, what? those are the features that worked so far. Those are the features that didn't work. If you want to create 10 more, where should we go? What should we try? So you're really searching like on the internet, trying to find by Sparks, trying to find other models that other people did, just to have an idea of which features to test next. Because every time that you create a new feature, you have to do checks on this feature to make sure that it's running well. So that data robot is doing as well. So every time that we create a new feature, there's a data quality assessment that's being done automatically behind the scenes. 
And the, here, there's a, a big thing on the democratization aspect that we're talking about. So as a junior data scientist or a data expert that doesn't have a lot of experience on machine learning itself, the platform is actually implementing the best practices and is managing them for you. So you can go one end to end on the project without thinking much about what exactly is happening because you can get a model that will have the alerts that are necessary attached to it at the end of the day. But if you are uh, more experienced and you really want to challenge the platform itself, you can really drill down on everything that the platform is doing and you can know exactly which model has been built, what the quality assessments that's been doing. If there's anything that you would like to do more than that, you can also do it on the platform. So all this is quite flexible. And here, yeah. yeah sure. uh, yes. Okay, so the question is, can we have holidays? Or uh, I'll expand it to any calendars or, or events that you know that are coming in the platform, or is it part of the data prep? So uh, the platform has on the settings a place for you to add uh, calendars. And in this case here, uh, we had it on the data set, but you can add a calendar or you can ask data robot to generate a calendar automatically for you. So you can say, okay, I'm the US, please use the holiday events calendar of the US. So you have Christmas, you have like Black Friday, all this. If you do that in uh, Asia, you have the holidays in Asia, you have big promotional events in Asia that will be added to. And you can create your own calendar if you want. You can create your own like marketing calendar with the promotions and other things that so you can add as well to the platform. So all this can be, uh, can be added. Yeah. It's a good one. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong, but like machine learning models, they often like work really well for the future and do so a lot like the past, you know, uh, which uh, I'm not sure if it's the case of your like, sales data set. But I was wondering if your system on this stage of the like, quality assessment, whether you do like statistical tests to, to like try to understand the predictability of. Okay, let me just uh, play it back, but I'll try to, to summarize. So it's basically machine learning has an assumption of the best has some resemblance to the future. So we train it on that. And then you're asking if the platform takes into account this difference and give any alerts, if there's anything that really goes out of the ordinary on this. Um, so a couple, of, a couple of things. So the first one would be really on the assumption first. So the thing is, with time series, that yes, you are using the properties of the past to predict the future. But then if I take an example on the COVID and the things that we're doing, so COVID actually hit the model that we were building, the sales forecasting model. And what we had to do with COVID was mostly find other features that would input this information of the event, the Black Swan event on the model. So you could take it into account as something that would change the properties. But then at the end of the day, um, if you try to actually model the COVID cases and the spread, it's much harder because there's many more properties that you have to add that you just don't know about. So it's really, it, it has different degrees of complexity. For sales forecasting, for, from what I've seen before, um, adding information about the event itself, like COVID or uh, a new like sales day that happened or something like this, would be enough for the derived features to get a hold of it and use it on the relationships going forward. Um, and then to the question, if the platform manages it by itself, some of the properties, yes, with the derived features, uh, you do have a lot of tools on the toolbox once your model is done to actually evaluate the model and understand the model. We will go through that in a minute, but you do have graphics on accuracy over time or differences on the data over time, like data drift. And all this can help you see uh, where the disparities are. So we can go back and take a look because usually what breaks a prediction most often is not really an event that changed everything. It's mostly something on the collection phase of the data that changed. Nobody knows upstream, and this data is just collected in a different way, and the model cannot assume anything about it. You just have a variable that got divided by 10, and you don't know what, but somebody just changed the unit and <laughs> didn't say anything to anyone else. So this kind of thing you can take on, on data robot, on the data drift part to see a bit uh, if there's a lot different. And then you can set thresholds on the operation that we, we can see a bit afterwards as well, but you can say, okay, if those values go beyond this interval that I trust, give them a default value or raise me alert, stop everything, like do not uh, deliver this prediction. All these you can, uh, you can manage on the platform as well. That goes a bit on the operationalization. Okay. Uh, Alex, you had a, 
Yeah. Uh, to the room. <laughs> to the field agents. <laughs> okay. uh, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a fair point. So let, let me play it back. It's basically a bit more information on try and error tests and to see where the challenges are coming from and what drives the iteration. So what makes you go another round and try it again. Um, so I would say that, so the first objective, if you think about the iteration, is basically two things. It's do not spend too much time on something before checking if it's working or not. So do not over-engineer whatever you're building. And the other one is to give really visibility on people that will use the model before you're building everything. So instead of spending time on building the whole like requirements, the, the, okay, I think the base assumption is that on a data science project, it's not, if you know the input, you do not know the output. It's really experimental. So you don't know from the beginning if it's gonna work or not. You know by experience that this data set looks like something that we're gonna work. I've done that 10 times. So maybe this one's not gonna be an exception. But uh, there's always a risk of this variable distribution, this data set specifically, do not get to the results that I'm, I'm searching for. So the idea of the trial error, error is really to go fast and to end, to have results that you can share, that you can compare to whatever you're expecting. So usually the beginning of the assumption is really on, as a business person, I need to get my accuracy at this level for me to be worth using your model. So usually for this, for this project specifically, what happens is that they had a manual process and they said, I'm not changing my manual process if you cannot do an automated process that's better than mine. If it's better, then we will talk about cost reduction and time and all this. But if it's not better, I'll keep my five people working on that every month. So what we're trying to do with them is go as fast as possible to the result, get the accuracy. On this uh, first trial, you get something that's not good enough. So you have to do again. So basically you have two reasons why you're doing it again. Either you're not there yet and you're going back to try and improve, or you get the results that are good, but then you go back to actually check that whatever you built is not based on assumptions that you cannot make. So maybe you're using information that you don't have access to when you're actually running the model, or uh, for some reason, you're not using uh, the right information at the right time. So all those things, once you get the results, you go back to check, and maybe you saw that there's some failures, failure point on your system, on the modeling, and then you iterate again. But it can be a push from the business saying that your metrics are not good enough. It can be a push on the technical side saying we built something that actually won't work in production because we are using things that we will not have access to when you are in production. Yeah. So, can you, so the because I didn't get everything, but at which time you regu regularize? Yeah, but at which stage you regularize? Regularize? Sorry, I don't. What's regularize? Regularize. Ah, remove. Okay, so the question is at which stage? from all those features that are built, I select the ones that I'm gonna use. Is that a fair assumption? Okay. So what the robot does when it's building those features is that it's building already with a certain heuristic based on the distribution of the data sets. It's gonna create the different uh, variables. And mostly when you're talking about mood series, the information from one series that you're using to the other one is gonna be based on assumptions on the data set. But then um, data robot, when it's actually running the modeling. So let me just quickly show what it looks like. So here, this model that this modeling that take like about 20, 25 minutes run and, and created 74 models for us. Each model has a different architecture that we can see here just to give you a glimpse on the, the transparency of the stuff. So we really see all the building blocks. And for each one of the models, when we're running it, this automation process, what it does is that it tunes each model with different sets of rules. One of the rules is the features. So for each model, for each architecture, when it runs, it will select 
uh, feature list that will have more impact in this model specifically. So here, just to show what exactly looks like in the platform, you have this first model. If I zoom out a little bit. Yeah, you have this first model that have used a feature list that's called multiple feature lists. This one that's using another feature list that's with differentiation, so the average baseline. So each one of those is uh, slightly different. So here's the data robot reduced feature list. So to answer your question, you have the access to all the features that, are being, that have been created here on the data tab. But then on the modeling tab, you can see for each model, data robot has selected a different uh, feature list to run them basically depending on the architecture and depending on the, the steps they are using for each one of them. And then you use different training data, you use different dates, you can use different pre-processing of the data. So all this is automated by, by the platform. And it's actually building this leaderboard by rounds. So you have a first round with a lot of different models, the ones that are uh, predicting better, so better performance. We'll go to the next round with a different set of parameters, a different set of data sets. Uh, data like data sets from the, the initial data set. And that's what happens to, to actually build this leaderboard with 74 models. So the 74 are not chosen at the beginning. You choose a set of 10, 15, and then those will give information to the platform for what's the next 10, what next 10 that's good. So it's a bit of an interactive process. A bit on the iteration if you actually, the platform is doing that automatically to, to the point of iteration. Um, just one, one highlight that we will see afterwards on, on this side if we get back, but here, on the project that I was working on, I was using about 20 features and we created 20 more features for the modeling process for the five models that we created. Here we have 250 new features that have been created by the platform automatically. So if you think about the time that you're actually spending coding those and then checking those and creating models with those, it's, it's cool the first few times because you're really like building it, scientific project is really cool. When you're doing that for the fifth time, at some point you just, you give other people to do this. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Uh, th thanks for the question. So just to, to play it back is basically what's the sweet spot or target audience of data robot basically because we are, we are going through some details and from time to time it looks like you need to know a bit more about data science to actually use it. And uh, I'll take a break because it's actually a really good pitch question for, for when we're like pitching and selling data robot. But so data robot has, if, if I really try to summarize it and uh, Alex, feel free to jump in if, if I'm going out of rails, but we have two main sweet spots in data robot and uh, they can actually collaborate together. So the first one is people that are interested in data science, that are data experts that know the domain knowledge, but they don't hold like coding skills, data science too. So quite junior data science that are coming out of school or uh, data analytics, business analysis, business intelligent people that want to either do the transition or not, but they're already working in data analysis and data analytics like Excel, Tableau, uh, Snowflake, other things. And the other big population sweet spot is more senior data scientists. Those two groups are using the platform slightly differently. So they go through the same process, but for the first group, you have those guardrails that make sure that you're using best practices along all the way. And you have the alerts that you can at least know what's going on. So you can drill down or ask for uh, outside help if it's really needed on the use case itself. But the platform is built in a way that you can go end to end uh, without knowing that much about data science, but you have to know about your data. You have to know what you're doing with your data and you have to know how to frame the problem itself. That's usually a, a teamwork. But as a data analyst, you can go and train and do everything. The difference is that, for instance, if we get to this model tab, as a data scientist, a junior data scientist or a data analyst, probably what I'm going to do is, OK, this guy is, was the, the best model that was selected by the platform. So I'll just go ahead and I'll, I'll deploy it. And I'll use it to, to work on my use case. So with a couple of clicks, you deploy it, you test it in production, and you have something that works. Maybe it's not the best option but it's something that you have access to it and you can deploy it. As an advanced data scientist, what you can do at this point is say, okay, I know this architecture. I'm not really sure why this one was the one that worked because I did it like twice last year and I was working the same use case. And I think there's another architecture that works better. 
you can actually run different models, choose different tunings, and you can do exactly what you want on the customized parts. You can uh, use different models, you can use different features, different like fine tuning for the model itself. And uh, when you run that, it's just gonna get added to this leaderboard. So you have your new idea being compared to whatever data robot has done. So at the end of the day, it becomes your workbench. It becomes really your workspace for data science that you can do without code, but you can also like build models elsewhere, bring it on to the data science platform to, to work on it. So as the more advanced users, usually the, the barrier that we have is that there's a bit of pushback on the fact that some people will see the tool as an accelerator and something that they can use to really go faster and do some of the work that they were doing before uh, manually. And some people will see really of, as a switch of tech stack and uh, as data scientists from time to time, we're really passionate about the tools that we use and really like to use the things that we are using to use, et cetera. But uh, when you put this flip on mindset of really production and uh, getting to a place that you use data robot to get your baseline as fast as possible. So instead of using two weeks of work to get your first model validated and evaluated, you're doing that like in three hours. And at this point, you can say, okay, now I have the rest of my two weeks sprint to actually work on new models and get something that's way better or a little bit better than this. But at least there's some push on uh, intellectual kind of a data science work. But your more junior colleague can actually get the baseline for you in like a half, half an afternoon. And then you, you can work on that and iterate on that. Did that answer your yes, question? Yeah. Does this automatically, let's say, for any one of these models, you have right now, Python script, you can look down afterwards? Ah. Because if you can write right now, Python, Okay, so, so the question is from the platform, from the models that are generated on the platform, uh, I'll generalize the question, what, what can we actually export from that? What we can actually bring outside of the platform? Um, I'll, I'll start answering the question and then I'll, I'll pass it to, to Alex for some of the specifics. But so here you have information about the model itself. You can export the model package, like the, the binary file that you can, you can use elsewhere afterwards. You can also explore like a Docker container with the model inside that it can run afterwards. I'm not sure about the code itself. Alex? Yeah, we have a scenario. Okay. Yeah, I'll just play back the, the answer. So there's a part on data prep. Uh, if we use the, the, the part of the data prep platform that's actually bringing tables together and de deriving new features from new table, this you can export as a SQL code. Okay. Okay. Pressure. Okay, so the question is on models stacking. As uh, so, it goes back to new models and customized models. So in data robot, you can also add new uh, new models by blending. So you can do your average blender, your medium blender, um, and other options of just mixing and matching the models that you already have on the leaderboard. You can also edit the models itself to to add pre-processing stages on each one of them. Um, yeah, I think yeah. that's uh, so, that's it. Yeah. Okay, the next one on the QLX. He's asking, what if I have my own model and I want to do it? Can I bring my own model uh, very different to somebody? Okay, so that's a, that's a good question. So, so just play it back. Can I bring my own model that we can call baseline model to, to the list and, and to compare it with the other ones? So in Data Robot, something that covers this and actually it was quite useful for the use case that I was working before because basically the metric that we were looking at was not an absolute metric but was a metric that was comparing what they had done before and what the model we, we could make so in data robot you can actually upload the results from your baseline from your model and use it as a, a baseline comparison on uh, on the metric system and have it on the on the leaderboard so you basically can have um uh, 
relative metrics that you can score your leaderboard by not only the absolute values of your accuracy or whatever metric you want to use, but just the difference between these new models accuracy versus what you had before or the results you, you generated offline. Okay. It's a, it's a fair question. So the question is from the machine learning models that we see here, does the platform also support on this automated way, uh, deep learning models and other complex models? And uh, the question is specifically talks about the feature derivations. So basically we have to create the features on our data set, but if you had raw like image features or, or whatever, uh, do we have like deep learning models that will actually extract those features from uh, the raw data? Um, so we do work with the learning model. It's just that it's not this list specifically. We, we don't have like the, the data on that. So just to expand on this question, um, data robot today works with uh, image location data. So GPS locations, uh, raw image, uh, text, numerical features, the categorical features. So if we run the same thing, same experience with the images, you see that deep learning model can be basically used in two different ways, either as, as you mentioned, like a feature extraction. So you have, on the blueprint, when you think about those uh, building blocks of the steps, you have deep learning models that are already trained that can be used just as feature extractions on the building steps, but you also have the ones to be used on, on the prediction part as well. It's just that in this case, it doesn't, it didn't come up on the leaderboard, but uh, they are supported, yeah. Uh, 